Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Jim Olson, Assistant Executive Director for the National Tile Contractors Association, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Sustainable Floor Coverings, The Case for Ceramic Tile. This program is designed to show how ceramic tile systems compare with other floor coverings regarding sustainability and environmental impact. Attendees will learn how ceramic tile installations conserve energy and resources and reduce the carbon footprint, and how ceramic tile installations reduce product cycle environmental impacts and can help optimize occupant health. Our sponsor for this presentation is Custom Building Products. Now before we continue, I have the following business to discuss. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the participant feedback or the chat screen on your computer to type in your questions, and we will answer those questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are archived and available to watch at any time after the webinars are presented. I will provide my email address on the chat screen when we begin. Please email your request to me. Also, today's program is AIA accredited for one hour of CEU. I will also uh, put Mike Little, our presenter today, I'll have his email on there and you can uh, contact him to get signed up for your CEU. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on your chat screen to listen on your phone. Okay, here we go. Today's speaker, Mike Little, is a 40-year veteran of the ceramic tile industry. He has held management positions in both sales and operations during his career in the ceramic tile industry. In addition, he has worked for both manufacturers and distributors in various capacities. For the last 14 years, Mike has worked as an architectural consultant with custom building products. Mike is a member of the Construction Specification Institute and is a construction documents technologist. He belongs to the Ceramic Tile Institute and is a certified tile consultant. Mike is also a professional affiliate with the Dallas chapter of the American Institute of Architects and an industry partner with the American Society of Interior Designers. He has earned the designation of Certified Concrete Slab Moisture Testing Technician from the International Concrete Repair Institute. Welcome, Mike. We're looking forward to a great presentation. Thanks, Jim. I certainly appreciate that. And thanks to all of the attendees who are joining us. What we're going to be talking about today is sustainable uh, floor coverings and how tile stands up to some of the other uh, choices that you may have in this arena. Uh, this is, as Jim mentioned, a one-hour health, safety, and welfare credit. Uh, if you email me, I'll be sure to get you a certificate so that you can report this. Some of the things that we're going to take a look at today include uh, Understanding how the life cycle cost comparisons are between tile and some of the other floor finishes. We'll talk about uh, how tile stands up regarding sustainability and environmental impact. Uh, we'll spend a, a, a good deal of time talking about VOC content and how it compares to the other choices. And then lastly, we'll try and, and cut through some of the confusion that results because of all of the different people that have their their hand in this green or sustainable uh, arena, and there it's it's too numerous to mention. When we talk about sustainability, it's it seems obvious on the surface, but it's often not as obvious as you may think. For example, you've got a, a, a photo here. From an environmental standpoint, the question is which one is more envi environmentally friendly? a styrofoam cup or a porcelain mug. Now, most people are going to pick the porcelain mug most of the time. And the answer to that question is, it really depends on what context you're putting this into. For example, let's say that we want to keep materials out of landfills. We're concerned about preserving the green space that we already have. Well, in that case, the porcelain mug wins hands down. Uh, <clears throat> the styrofoam cup is not biodegradable, uh, as are most uh, petroleum byproducts. Uh, the porcelain mug theoretically could be reground and used in other materials, and if not, they're natural materials that would just go back to the soil. So that that's an easy win for the porcelain mug. But let's let's 
let's say we're concerned about water conservation. And, and believe me, there are parts of the world and parts of the United States that are very concerned about that. Uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, there's a lake that's, that's on the border between Georgia and North Carolina called Lake Lanier. And it provides most of the drinking water for Atlanta, Georgia and surrounding areas. And about 10 or 12 years ago, the Corps of Engineers did a study and found out that that lake was within months of going dry. Well, I can assure you that if you're designing facilities in that particular area, water conservation is, is a great deal, you know, means a great deal to you. So from a water conservation standpoint, <coughs> the, the styrofoam uh, cup wins hands down because a lot of water is used in the process of making a, a porcelain or ceramic material. All right, let's, let's look at another aspect. Let's, let's look at energy consumption. A lot of people are concerned with how much energy is being consumed, particularly if that energy is, is, is <clears throat> derived from uh, fossil fuels. Well, here's, here it gets a little bit tricky. From an energy standpoint, it requires twice as much energy to make the styrofoam as it does to make an equal amount of porcelain. The problem is the ceramic mug weighs about 70 times as much as the or this, the styrofoam cup, so it, it skews that, that uh, characteristic pretty significantly. The other aspect is the styrofoam cup is just thrown away. The porcelain mug is reused, it's washed. And if you wash a porcelain mug in a dishwasher on a warm water setting, you're using as much energy to wash that cup as it would take to make a styrofoam cup. So again, whether one is better than the other it really depends on the concept on the context uh, particularly from a health standpoint health is, is another aspect uh, the the basic product that's used to make styrofoam is styrene it's a petroleum byproduct and if you look it up styrene has has some very significant health risks associated with it it's one of the reasons that a lot of the more health conscious companies are choosing to, to get away from styrofoam containers and go to paper ones. So the, the idea is that there's an easy and quick answer for all of these sustainable questions is not necessarily true. It really re requires finding out what your, your particular concern is. Now when we talk about comparing flooring materials in particular, I thought I'd start with probably the, the most rapidly growing flooring material out there, and that's a plastic-based flooring material. It's one of the more popular options out there. From a global standpoint, this particular market segment is, is predicted to grow at a 12.8% compound annual growth rate. Now what that means is that it's an $18 billion worldwide industry in 2019 and it's projected to reach $31 billion by the, by the year 2024 in just five short years. So when we talk about plastic-based flooring materials, what are we talking about? Because there's a lot of, a lot of different types of, of plastic floorings. Uh, these are just some of the more common ones. We've got luxury vinyl tile. And luxury vinyl tile is an industry term. It's not a standard. We've got wood polymer composition flooring, and we've got stone polymer composite flooring, clay polymer composite flooring, and then rigid core board. All of these <clears throat> are petroleum-based products that require some kind of a chemical process to be produced. Now, why is LVT in particular so popular? Well, it, for some very good reasons. Consumers and designers like LVT for its low prices, it's very realistic graphics. It has the ability to mimic uh, wood, stone, uh, tile. Uh, it, it, it's a very effective product. Uh, it, they like it for its durability and its maintenance aspects. Now, the two photographs that you see there, the photograph on the left is an LVT product. The photograph on the right is a, is a, a porcelain tile product. So similar looks and similar uh, uh, a feel to the to the product itself. The other thing that comes into play here is the, the expense of installation. 
LVT is a much less expensive product to install. So you, you take all of those factors and it gives it the kind of growth rate that we just talked about. So what is LVT? Well, what you're looking at on the screen right now is the chemical uh, uh, equation for making uh, LVT, which is the polymerization of the vinyl chloride mon monomer. As you can tell, it's a chemical process. It starts with the petroleum byproduct. It's, it's done uh, on, a, on a chemical uh, basis, and it's, it's the building block for most of these uh, plastic-based fluorines. So is LVT a good sustainable choice? Well, here's where I, I throw up a caution sign. I think there, there are some things about LVT or plastic-based flooring that are cause for concern. Why, you know, why isn't it maybe a, the best choice available? Well, number one, there is no completely safe way to manufacture or dispose of PVC. Much like our styrofoam, all of these different plastic-based floorings are not biodegradable. So that they're going, at the end of their life, they're going to end up in, in some kind of a landfill somewhere, and we don't really know how long it's going to take for that material to decompose if it ever does. Vinyl chloride itself has been classified as a human carcinogen. It's actually on the Living Building Challenge Red List. It's one of those, those in, ingredients that, that they're concerned about. Uh, it's not biodegradable. Uh, PVC contains ethylene dichloride, mercury, and other chemicals, and most of which have been banned from children products and other consumer goods. And then finally, the emissions, the VOCs from PVC, create health hazards including dioxins and furans, two of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. In addition, there are phthalates that are added. Now what you're looking there is the chemical composition of phthalates. And what are phthalates and how do they relate to an LVT? Well, phthalates are plasticizers. It's what they use to make PVC softer and more pliable. Uh, the PVC piping that you see is <clears throat> that we commonly use in irrigation systems and whatnot is the same kind of PVC, but it, none of these phthalates have been added to it. Once they add these phthalates to it, the problem is there are, are many different types of phthalates available, and some have been proven to cause cancer, and then some have been shown to be endocrine dis disruptors. And the problem is we really don't know which ones are being used in LVT because of a lack of proper labeling. In many cases, that particular product can be, can be termed a, a proprietary product and it doesn't have to be listed on any kind of labeling as it now exists. So we sometimes don't know what's in that particular product. So what about degradation or well wear of LVT? Degradation, you know, the, the wearing of this product occurs over a, a long period of time. It results in the surface becoming brittle and microcracking. And then when it starts to microcrack, these small, very, micro, very small particles uh, continue in the air, and these particles act like little sponges, and they soak up persistent organic pollutants around them. And the difficulty with this is, at that point, these are small enough that they can be ingested. You can breathe them in. You, you know. and, and one of the areas that I see uh, the LVT being used most commonly and in, in huge masses is in schools. And it just it, it bothers me that that's a possibility for these kids, you know, as this product continues to wear, for them to be breathing in something that it's, it's, you know, could be that hazardous to them. So that's, that's one of the most popular products out there. How about tile? Tile's been around for a long time. Why is tile such a better choice from a sustainable standpoint? Well, number one, ceramic tiles are made from natural occurring minerals. The life expectancy of a ceramic or porcelain tile is 60 years. 60 years is the life of a building. It's a lifetime product. What it means is that the the flooring or the wall uh, finish that you use 
is, if it's installed and, and selected properly, will be there for the life of the building. It will not have to be replaced other than for aesthetic reasons. Ceramic tiles did not contribute VOCs to the air. There's no off-gassing of ceramic tile. They can't become contaminated. Uh, porcelain tile, as we all know, has less than one half a percent absorption. Uh, it's safe for those with chemical sensitivities. Once it's installed, it, <clears throat> it's virtually non-detectable. And it can be disposed of safely. In fact, there are, there's at least one company out there that's actually using uh, porcelain tile that's been uh, removed from existing job sites and they're actually using that in the process of making more ceramic tile and porcelain tile. And virtually every manufacturer does that from the inside of the factory. Uh, they're using what doesn't pass for standard grade material and they're recycling it back, grinding it back up, and using it in the body of the material. And that occurs for just about all of the ma major manufacturers here in the United States. When we talk about natural materials for ceramic tile, the two main components of, of porcelain tile are clays and feldspars. It comes from the earth. It's, a, it's a, a naturally occurring product. It's one of the reasons that it can be disposed of so easily. It goes back to the earth. So it's, it's made from natural ingredients. It, it's naturally inert. It's hypoallergenic. It's free from any toxic chemicals. There are no VOCs, no formaldehyde, or no PVC in ceramic tile whatsoever. In addition to those qualities, it's also slip resistant, fire resistant, energy efficient, and very, very sustainable. Now, when we talk about comparing flooring materials, one of the things is, that's important to do is to make sure that we're comparing the entire system. <clears throat> the entire system includes whatever it is that we're installing that particular flooring with, because it all has a very serious impact on, on the relationship of that material. So let's take a look. One of the things that uh, lead version 4 did when it came out was switch the sustainable subject matter from single attributes of particular products to a more holistic view. And, and a big part of that were life cycle assessments. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But I thought it's important enough to talk about there are different types of life cycle assessments. And it's important to know this because depending on which one is chosen, it can really have a huge impact on how that particular product looks. The first one on there is cradle to gate life cycle assessment. And what this means is they're looking at all of the energy and environmental impact of gathering all the raw materials to make a particular product, the manufacture of that product, and then the, the, the assessment stops at the gate of the factory. It doesn't include, uh, for example, transportation costs to any, anybody using it down the road. Uh, it's, it's a very short life cycle assessment, and it's, and it's one that a lot of manufacturers use because obviously it looks, you know, it's, it's a more favorable res, uh, result than if it was to take, you know, take it a little bit further. The next one on there is called cradle to grave. Cradle to grave starts with the accumulation of all of the raw materials necessary to make the product, and that includes the, the energy needed to mine it or to make it, the energy to transport it, uh, uh, the energy to manufacture the final product. It takes it th <clears throat> through the cycle of, of if there are middlemen involved, the middlemen to the end user, uh, and then the, the use of that product and cradle to grave stops at the, the removal and disposal of that particular product. That's probably the most common kind out there. The other life cycle assessment and the one that the sustainable experts would like to see us use is cradle to cradle. And the difference here is we're still assembling all of the materials needed to manufacture a particular product 
we're still manufacturing the product. We're still getting it to the end user. The end user is using it. The only difference is what we're talking about here is once the product has reached the end of its useful life, how is it recycled back into the, into the system so that it's a circular motion rather than just ending up in a landfill? And that's the one that's, that most people, you know, most environmentalists would like to see us use. And obviously, all of those life cycle assessments take into account what are the life cycle costs involved with these particular products. Now, the, the chart that you're seeing uh, was done several years ago, but it's still, the ratios are still, still very much uh, uh, consistent. And it talks about, what we're looking at here is the cost of, uh, the, the initial cost of the products themselves, the installation of the products themselves, and the maintenance expected for the life of that particular product, and then replacing that product at the end of its useful life. So while LVT and some of these other choices are very, very inexpensive initially due to the, the initial in installation costs and material costs, they have to be <clears throat> replaced on a much more frequent basis. We've already talked about ceramic tile being a lifetime product. So <clears throat> if the, the LVT has to be replaced on a, uh, a five-year, 10-year, whatever basis, it may, be, it may be replaced three, four, five times during the life of that building. These costs that you're looking at reflect that. And as you can see, uh, most of the tiles here are in the 30 cents, you know, <clears throat> 30 cents per square foot per year range, and it goes down from there all the way down to VCT, which is, you know, at a at a dollar eighty three per square foot. So, yes, the initial cost may be more, but the life cycle cost of ceramic tile are so much better because it doesn't need to be replaced. One of the real hot buttons with sustainable in general are VOCs. It's probably one of the first things that started this, this uh, particular drive. VOCs are volatile organic compounds. These are gases that are emitted into the air from different products. Some are harmful by themselves, and then in addition to that, some can be combined with other gases and form other air pollutants. Now, some of these are, are inevitable, and they're, they're available and, and around us more so than we know. For example, here are just building materials, home and personal products, and fuels and machinery that all have VOC contents of one kind or another on, in them. Um, and as you can see, some of these are, are, are you wouldn't have expected that. Uh, so it's, it's a product that's all around us, and obviously what we're trying to do is reduce this as much as, as humanly possible. That's why most of the sustainable guidelines that we see have a VOC limit based on the product category itself. Uh, very important consideration. So when it comes to VOCs, how does ceramic tile, and particularly the installation materials that we use, how does it compare to some of the other flooring products that you, that you have available to you? Well, ceramic tile doesn't, as we've already discussed, doesn't have any VOCs in it. So it's a 0, 0.0. The installation adhesives that you see there, that 0 0.9, refers to there are some uh, epoxy bonding and, and grouting materials that do have some small levels of VOCs in them. I can design a ceramic-based or a cement-based uh, installation for you using a cement-based mortar and a cement-based grout that very easily has absolutely no VOCs within, this, within the entire installation itself. Now you combine, you know, you compare that to the linoleum and some of the, the broad looms and the adhesive, and particularly the adhesives that, that, that those particular products use, and you can see that by comparison, there are just a lot more VOCs of, available in a lot of these products. Now, I will tell you that over the years, all of the manufacturers, you know, are, are 
doing their best research and, and development to remove as many VOCs as they can from products. It's why there are VOC levels, you know, for example, in, in LEED uh, uh, as, as, uh, as defined by one of their sections. So these are just comparisons to say, you know, if it, if it has a little bit, okay, it may not be, you know, totally harmful to you, but zero is still better than even a small uh, amount. So our, our installation materials, they have very low VOC contents. Our cement-based materials have none. Uh, the only time you, again, the only time you find VOC content is usually in solvent-based sealers and some of our epoxy materials. Um, our cement-based materials uh, don't support the growth of mold and mildew, not necessarily because there's anything added to that particular product but most of the time because cement-based products by nature are highly alkaline. <clears throat> um, and, and the fact is that mold and mildew has a very difficult time living in, a, in a, an alkaline environment. Uh, I can show you water-based maintenance products, both sealers and cleaners, uh, that have no VOCs in them that are just as effective as some of the solvent-based. Uh, we have membranes, sound attenuation membranes, that actually improve acoustic environments, particularly hard surface floors over occupied space. So there's an acoustic improvement. And then finally, a lot of the manufacturers are using lightweight materials in their mortars and grouts <clears throat> to help reduce the weight of the products. And that reduction in weight has a tremendous impact on the emissions for the transportation uh, of that product to the end use. So it, it has a tremendous effect. And that's one of those categories that often doesn't really show up uh, <clears throat> in, in the lead format or the Green Globes format or anything else. There isn't a particular category uh, for that. So <clears throat> one of the difficulties we get into is there are so many organizations and, and companies and whatnot that are really involved in the green uh, or sustainable arena. There are, there are companies like Green Seal, Green Guard, Green Label Plus, Green Building Initiative, Green Home Guide, Green Globes. And those are just companies that have green as the first name in them. So part of the problem or the confusion that we have is what are all these companies doing? <clears throat> well, most of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the time, well, what they're doing is in one of these four areas. It's either standards, rating systems, codes, or third-party verification companies. So there are several initiatives that will help specifiers in particular <clears throat> with the selection of products that are sustainable, particularly in our industry. ANSI 138.1, Green Squared, was the Tile Council initiative that developed the standards for determining what is a green or sustainable product within our industry. It started out as a Tile Council initiative and was so well done <clears throat> that ANSI agreed to put it in as a standard for their use. One of the advantages of, of 138.1 is it stretches across some of these other areas. Uh, it, it, it makes it easy to comply with LEED version 4, IGCC, the building code, the NAHB, the ASHRAE, the Green Globes. It has, it has the ability to cross over all of these different organizations and, and uh, material types and allows them the ability to select materials that they know are going to uh, going to be, you know, be usable in that particular arena. And this, you know, when we talk about the sustainable, in, you know, one of the things that I like about 138.1 is that it's not just product focused. It's not just looking at the end product. It's also looking at the manufacturers. Are the manufacturers being prudent in the use of, of raw materials? Are the manufacturers being prudent with the use of energy? <clears throat> And I can give you an example from personal experience. I worked for a manufacturer 
back in the 70s. And at that particular time, even then, this particular manufacturer was recycling all of the water that was being used in the production process for, for all of their tile. They were taking the heat off of the kilns where they were firing this tile, and in the winter they would use that to heat the office space. So they were doing this not because sustainable was a big issue back then, but they were doing this because it made, it made sense from a business standpoint. And the, the, the American manufacturers have always been on the forefront of making sure that they're, they're using resources properly, uh, you know, not just from a sustainable standpoint, but from a business standpoint. Now, <clears throat> with lead version four, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, the focus became less on products and more on processes. And one of the things that they look for in lead version four is environmental product declarations. These are product reports that are saying, here's what's in our particular products, and <clears throat> it's why, you know, it's, it's how they're used to judge whether one product is sustainable and another isn't. We have broad scope re product reports available to us in the ceramic tile industry. The Tile Council has, has one on, on tile, and one on setting materials and routes for uh, all of the products manufactured in North America which qualify for those new uh, credit opportunities. Health product declarations are like labeling for products. It's here's what's in this product and here's, here's the, the chemical content uh, and, and here's it, it helps identify any particular um, material ingredients that may be hazardous. And every manufacturer has the ability to, to give you a health product declaration that shows you in, in detail what the product is made up of and, and if there are any, uh, any you know, products of concern or ingredients of concern in that particular product. And as I mentioned, ANSI 138 was developed by Tile Council members. It covers not only the tile, but the installation products. And it is product, not project specific. In other words, it's looking at individual products. It has a full sustainable commitment. It's looking at the manufacturer as well as the product. It, it will give you VOC contents very clearly in terms of a percentage. It will talk about recycled content, and it will, it will tell you it will, it will give you an advantage on locally uh, produced materials, which used to be a part of the lead, uh, lead process. Now, we also have green rating systems. These differ in that they're not product driven, they're project driven. They're looking at the entire installation, the entire building. Uh, the most common one out there is by the U.S. Green Building Council, the LEED version, but we also have the Living Building Challenge and Green Gloves, which are all designed to measure the environmental impact of, a, of an entire building project. <clears throat> of those, LEED is, is probably the most commonly used, and the 2009 version measured very specific things. Uh, in materials and resource, it measured recycled content and regional materials. Regional materials were materials that were extracted, processed, and manufactured within 150 miles of the, uh, uh, of the job site. It also measured indoor environmental quality. And it measured the, the adhesives and sealants used in that for low emitting materials. And it also uh, uh, allowed a credit for flooring systems that had low emitting materials. Ceramic tile in this particular lead version was one of the few products that didn't have to justify that it was a low emitting material. It was, it was uh, assumed by everybody involved, including lead, that it had no VOCs and it had no mat uh, emitting materials that could ca cause harm to the environment. It was one of the one of the things that made the, one of the, the subsequent versions very easy to use from a credit standpoint. But version four changed, changed quite a bit. It changed the, the dialogue of, of sustainability. Uh, they wrapped most of those other credits into a more holistic or, or wide-reaching uh, environment. 
For example, under materials and resource, they now have a building product disclosure and optimization uh, category where you have the option to achieve credits for, for participation in this, in this uh, category. And it includes the environmental product declarations and the, the industry declaration that the Tile Council did is, is viable for that particular credit. And it also includes the health product declarations that the individual manufacturers can supply. So it makes it easier for that, uh, uh, for that credit to be qualified. On the indoor environmental quality, there are VOC content limits for on-site wet applied products. Uh, that didn't change much. The, the level of VOC content didn't change. Uh, they just required a different testing mechanism to determine whether or not something met those, those, uh, those criteria or not. And the emissions requirement uh, required specific testing to make sure that there was an apples to apples comparison for that particular credit. All of these things made it a little bit more difficult for the manufacturers, but the fact is everybody has adjusted to this and now has a, the ability to tell you, you know, how, how their particular products can help you, uh, help you toward the, the credit op opportunities in each of these uh, lead categories. We also have green building codes, uh, ICC 700 for commercial, uh, for residential, and IGCC for commercial. And building codes are just like other ICC regulations. In order to be required, they have to be adopted by municipalities. Now, I know of one particular case where the, the municipality actually adopted a code before it was finalized. It was in Maryland, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I sit on the... Uh, ASTM E60 committee for sustainable products and, and it was amazing that in the rush to make sure that they were part of this sustainable or green environment, uh, uh, municipalities got a little bit ahead of themselves. But the fact is they can be adopted by municipalities and when they are, they no longer become a voluntary program, it becomes mandatory. All of the products have to meet the various qualities that are set forth in that particular uh, uh, category. And the, the, the particular product components that, the, that they're measuring are very similar to LEED. In fact, if you look across all of these different codes and rating systems, you're going to find that they're, they're, their system is pretty much, <clears throat> is pretty much uh, measuring the same things, VOC content, recycled content, all of those things are going to show up in these various codes and, and rating systems. Then we get into the green building third-party certification services. Third-party certification simply means that in, uh, it's an independent organization has reviewed the manufacturing process of a particular product and has determined that the, that the final product actually complies with specific standards. Now, when it comes to the green environment, most of what they're talking about is VOCs. For example, when Green Guard first came out, the only thing they were measuring was VOC content. So what they would do is they would take your products, they would measure, you know, they would test them according to the testing methods uh, applicable, and they would measure the VOC content and they would say, yes, the, this particular product meets this particular category for that particular standard. So uh, I, I caution, I caution uh, uh, designers and architects, don't get caught up with a particular testing method so much as with the requirement that the products meet certain standards. And again, an easier way to do this is to make sure that you're specifying 138.1 green squared materials as opposed to having it independently tested because these, these independent testing uh, labs are very expensive and they do it on a per product basis and many manufacturers simply don't have the wherewithal to test all of their products all of the time, you know, to meet these specific categories. And sometimes if you, you put down it must meet a certain third-party certification, you may be eliminating products that are actually more sustainable for your particular project 
but someone who has a better sustainable uh, prod, uh, product may not be able uh, to meet that particular uh, certification just because of the cost. So be careful uh, when you use that. So the upshot of all of this that we're talking about is that ceramic tile systems provide one of the most environmentally and economically sound flooring alternatives out there. It's a long-term product. It has virtually no health uh, uh, detriment to, to anybody, any of, any of the users. Uh, and, and it's a lifetime product that will last for the life of the uh, project or the building. So I thank you. Are there any questions, Jim? Mike, um, great job. You uh, provided some very important environmental health and green build information, and uh, uh, I think it's very important to us and our, our world. But uh, we do have a couple questions. So the okay. first question uh, has to do with the slide I clicked up right now, your slide number 23, and it's talking uh -huh. about VOC numbers. Are those VOC numbers in um, uh, unit of measure of grams per liter? No, actually they're in milligrams per square meter. Uh, it was, I, I, that's information that was taken from the uh, Building for Environmental and Economic Sustainability uh, Manual. Great. I, uh, uh, I did not know that. So um, next question is um, from slide number 30. You were talking, mm -hmm. let's see here. All right. So what about construction and demolition weight, um, waste management points for your, LED, for your LEED certification? I, Do you have any information I, on the, that? At the present time, it doesn't show up in any of the categories uh, under new materials. It may show up under the waste material management category. All right. Um, in regards to your, your finishing there, can EPD be self-declared? No. No, environmental product declarations cannot be self-declared, but an industry can put one out similar to what the Tile Council did uh, for the tile industry. Uh, Industry-wide EPDs are certainly acceptable to lead, but they cannot be self-declared self unless they go to the expense of a life cycle assessment. Now, the reason that, that industry-wide EPDs are so valuable is that it allows you know, companies to share information when there's a commonality uh, of materials being used. And that's, that's, you know, most companies, you know, don't have the $150,000 it takes to do a uh, life cycle analysis of each particular product. So they, they kind of go in as an industry and lump those together. So no, no they can't be, they can't be, uh, it can't be self uh, self declared. That has to come from either a, a third party or, or in, in this case, tile council. All right. Talking about life cycles, if there's mm -hmm. a project where you know they're going to change the floor every seven or eight years, how would you assess those costs, or what material is ideal to use? Well, you know, it's it's funny. We have we have that kind of situation that occurs a lot in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, their life cycle costs are, are astronomical because they're usually, usually looking at about a five-year lifetime in, you know, in these casinos and, and hotels. Uh, so it just, you just have to take that into account you know, in determining what finished materials are you know, going to provide the best value for the money at that particular point. It, it, changes, it changes the equation you know, dramatically. Yeah, and I think you would take each category and figure it out for seven to eight years um, as opposed to, yes. uh, you know, the years like uh, ceramic and, and tile you put, I think, 60 years of lifetime of a building or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's just a, ma a mathematical, you know, figure you can figure out. So that's great. Correct. Um, where, can, where can you find more information on testing methods and certifications? Uh, ANSI 138.1. Has has some some very specific testing methods uh, uh, listed in there uh, in determining what we you know we consider to be uh, sustainable in our industry. That's the best best avenue for that. Okay. 
And it looks like our last question today, Mike, is so um, the EPD released by TCNA, that's valid for all products? It's valid for all uh, ceramic and porcelain tiles manufactured in, in North America. It's valid for all grouts, and it's valid for all uh, cement-based grouts, and it's valid for all cement-based mortars manufactured in North America. Great, great. Again, um, everybody, Mike provided some great information on environmental, health, green build, um, very important to our, uh, our, our life, our lifestyle, the world. And uh, I hope you guys take this and share it. Please email your uh, request for the archive version. Share it with your architects, designers, um, building owners, fantastic information. Mike, thank you. Everybody, thank you for coming. Please look forward to our uh, next webinar coming up in, uh, in uh, December. Looking forward to it. And uh, thank you all. Thank you.